And praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome back to the Biblos Network. We are so glad that you've decided to join us again today. I know there are many things you could be doing with your day, many other ways you could be investing your time, but investment into the reading of the Word of God, the love of the Word of God is one of the most valuable things that a person could ever do. So we're, we're glad that you've decided to take this little bit of time and join us today. It is rapidly approaching summertime. The heat is rising and um, we are bu- we're busy. We're busy here in Durham, both at FPC and TDV. So many good things going on. The devil's fighting, but God's kingdom is victorious. God's going to give us strength. He's going to give us grace. And I know he's going to do that where you are as well. So, um, a lot of things, a lot of things have been on my heart here as of late. I want to take a little time and talk about them. Um, recently someone asked me a question and I have been asked this question before. I was asked brother Urshan, how should I read my Bible? And then sometimes they'll ask it, how do you read your Bible? How do you study the Bible? What is the best way for a person to read the Bible, to to learn, to put things together? How do you view the Word of God? Where do you get the material at that you talk about on Biblos? Well, it's a good question. Maybe I'll, I'll take a few minutes and talk about it today because reading the Word of God is one of the most enriching and powerful exercises that a person can, can get involved in. Um, where to start? There's different ways to read the word of God. People read the word of God in different ways. There's a, an academic way to read it. This is if, you know, you're going to look into Greek and Hebrew, if you're going to look into the smattering of, of Aramaic that is in there, theologically, there's a lot of books that have been written, commentaries that have been written in German and, 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 and French, Latin. And so typically when a person gets a degree, an advanced degree in theology of some kind, they have to learn at least two languages and oftentimes a third language that they have to at least be conversant in um, to some degree. So there's an academic way to read the word of God. These are for the pointy headed ones among us, (laughs) the pointy headed intellectuals. And I'll say about that academic reading that it is possible to read the Bible with the most advanced skills, with the sharpest minds, with the greatest commentaries and still completely miss God's words thrust the, the principal matter. And I think a great example of this is Saul, who becomes the Apostle Paul. He was one of the most learned men of his day, a Pharisee of Pharisees, the Bible says. And in all of that learning and all of that memorization, all of that profound insight into the scripture, he was completely blind, blind to the things of God, to the point that God had to blind him temporarily to make him see. So God had to take away his education, had to take away his pharisaical background, his Sanhedrin credentials, and turn him into a a blind, helpless, stricken man on the road to Damascus. And Ananias comes and prays for him. The Lord speaks to him on the road. Then Ananias comes to pray for him and it falls from his eyes like scales and he can finally see. So all the education in the world doesn't do you any good if you don't have revelation. And, you know, there are people that will try to make you feel bad because you don't know other languages. I've spoken to Greek scholars, Hebrew scholars before that badly twisted and distorted the word of God to suit their bias. And when it was exposed to scrutiny and by peer-reviewed academic scrutiny. Um, It fell apart what they were saying. And the idea that you have to know multiple languages and that you have to be an academic elite 
to understand the word of God is the antithesis of why Jesus came. When Jesus came, he revealed himself to fishermen and to tax collectors and to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he cast seven devils. He, he revealed himself in the most common ways and in, in the most simple, straightforward manner. Later on, as the Catholic Church took um, authority and dominion, you find that the priests gradually uh, excluded the common people from the conversation to the point where uh, since most scripture was written in Latin and the populace in Europe was largely uneducated and illiterate, that you cannot understand the Bible unless you come through us. And they basically created a monopoly on the word of God, plunged the world into the dark ages. It was a horrific time, um, a time of great abuse, great superstition, um, great persecution of people of faith. And it sprung from the idea that there had to be academic elites, even to the point where they would kill you if they found you with a Bible. You are too common and petty to, to, to handle the word of God. And so because the academic elites controlled the conversation, um, clergy became very wealthy. They, the Pope had standing armies. They killed people. They grossly distorted the word of God. They used it for selfish purposes, and it wasn't until common men rose up with the advent of the printing press, common men got their hands on the Bible that everything exploded, knowledge exploded, the Reformation, the Renaissance, secular education exploded, uh, theological uh, theology exploded, I should say it that way. Um, so God always wanted to put his, hand, his word into the hands of the common man, fishermen, tax collectors, and the simple. So I'm all for academics. I love academics. I, I believe in an academic approach, but revelation is paramount. A work of the Spirit trumps education. All the degrees in the world, as one old preacher said, more degrees than a thermometer will not help you if you do not know the mighty God in Christ. Flesh and blood has not revealed this unto me, unto thee rather, but unto my Father, but, but by my Father which is in heaven. So it is the Father in heaven that reveals, the Spirit reveals to mankind his word. Pharisees didn't know it, Sadducees didn't know it, kings didn't know it, sages did not know it, but the Father that was in heaven revealed it unto Peter by revelation, and a simple fisherman was given the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So be careful with academic reading. It has its place, but, but I'll just say that. Now, there is devotional reading. This is a kind of a reading that um, you take strength and encouragement from the word of God. Many people love the Psalms, the Proverbs, what they call the poetic books, Job, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, very beautiful writing, very poetic, very metaphor-driven. Uh, beautiful examples of Hebrew poetry. Um, I find that a lot of prisoners, men and women in jail, in prison, that are very uh, downcast, very discouraged, at a very low point, they, they love the poetic books because it soothes their soul. And um, there's that. And, and, and the common people do. G many generations um, would have the old Bible sitting next to their chair and it would be well-worn. And there's many mothers in Zion and many great men of God who love the word of the Lord. They gave God their time, gave God their, their attention and invested them in themselves and their character and their, um, their spirit reflected the depth and the richness of sp devoting their time to God, hence the term devotional, devotional reading. Um, I can remember the little bread of life um, reading formats where they would actually have this little plastic, uh, like, like a bread <laughs> with a little slot cut in the middle of it and little scriptures you'd take out of it. I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of you remember that. You do have to be a little careful, though, with that kind of reading because people tend to focus on the positive things, you know, <clears throat> and, and, the Bible read in that manner can kind of just be all the nice things 
that God has to say, all the big positive things. If, it, if it's positive, then, then I want to read it. You got to be careful with that because the Bible is not just a bunch of positives. It's not an emotional salve. But there are, there are negative consequences to choices and behaviors and lifestyles. And so when you're going to read for devotional purposes, take the positive commandments, the negative commandments, take the whole thing. One place said, um, eat the whole book. It'll be sweet in your mouth, bitter in your belly. Uh, and one apostle said it like this. He said, I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. So I'm not trying to heap to myself teachers having itching ears. I'm not trying to escape sound doctrine. I want the whole revelation of the word of God, the whole counsel of God. So devotional reading is a great thing if you are willing to apply every aspect of the word of God. Now, how do, how do I read it? That, that has been asked of me before. And <clears throat> um, I guess I'll say I, it, it was kind of done in stages. Um, a big part of my life, probably from the time I was 18 to almost 30, I read nothing but the Bible. Five chapters a day, 10 chapters a day. Um, just read and read and read. And, and you have to get the data into your mind. You have to become familiar with the word of God. You're looking for um, that familiarity, that ability to grow sensitive to the shepherd's voice. You want to hear the voice of God. You want to be familiar with it. You will never understand and be able to discern the lies of a false prophet and false teaching if you don't know the voice of the shepherd. And so oftentimes I can tell when a person is a Bible reader, if they're going to use the term repent, there's a ring to that word. It's, it's a Bible word. If um, they're, they're going to quote scriptures a certain way, I can tell they've spent time. Uh, Larry Booker uh, told me one time, he said, if you're going to read the word of God, um, take the time to really dwell there. And he talked about the hummingbird that lingered long at the flower to get to the nectar. He lingered at the flower, linger in the word of God, meditate upon the word of God. There's honey in that rock. There is honey in that revelation. I had to get it into my mind, into my heart. I had to divorce myself from the thoughts of secular society. Stop thinking the way society programs you to think, begin to think in a scriptural, biblical manner. A Middle Eastern mindset is very different from a Western mindset. If somebody comes to me and begins to talk about accepting Christ or uh, repeating prayers or talking to me about um, catechisms and uh, different concepts that are not scriptural. I'm going to look sideways at them. I'm going to know that there's a lot more religion in there than there is actual scripture. You develop an ear for the word of God. And when preachers, false prophets in particular, false teachers, a lot of televangelists, pretty much all televangelists, when they are preaching, Many in the populace can't discern what is true and what is not because they don't read the Bible. They just take things at face value. And there is no substitute for reading it for yourself. You become familiar with the shepherd's voice. So you will know his voice. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. They will not go to another. It's one of the reasons why we reject the concept of the Trinity. There are people that will make comments and post things on Biblos and other venues. And they will say things like, how can you not believe the Trinity? The Trinity is a Bible doctrine. No, no, it's not. It's not a Bible doctrine. Please find it. Show it to me. Where's it at? I can't find it. Um, <clears throat> and the truth is society in the religious world has been conditioned by false teaching for a couple thousand years to view God in a, a threeness, and the Bible does not support that. When you take that concept away and you just look at the Bible for what it says, it has been superimposed by two millennia 
of false teaching and corrupt church dogma, false church dogma. Um, so you have to get the data into your head. You have to get the knowledge into your head. Um, the word of God has to be hid in your heart that you do not sin against God. You become familiar with Bible concepts. You know, have you ever met somebody that you're just familiar with? Your best friend, your husband, your wife, uh, your child. You just know them. You know them better than anybody. If they walk in the room, you can see by their body language uh, how they're feeling. And I can walk in the room and maybe I'm not feeling that great. And the moment I walk in, my wife will go, what's the matter? <laughs> and I'm like, what? What? I, I'm fine. What's the matter? What, what, do you, what do you mean, what's the matter? No, something's wrong. I can tell. And I have no idea what vibe I'm giving off. I guess it's the set of my face. It's how I'm chewing my lip or I have no idea. But she has been around me for almost 30 years and she just knows me and vice versa. I can tell when she is feeling a certain way. We're, we're familiar. We, we know each other intimately and, and there'll be other people in your life that are that way. That's the way it should be with God. Even if a person is on the phone with you, you can tell their voice. If they disguise their voice on the phone, you can still hear the timber and, and the nuance of their voice and you can pierce the disguise. You can see through, or I guess hear through <laughs> their disguised voice. You can say, I'm not falling for that. I know who this is. And so that is how we should be with the word of God. When you become familiar with the scripture to that degree, when you have dreams and God sends you dreams, you will be able to pick up on his voice in the dream. You'll be able to tell the difference between a dream that's just chaos and <clears throat> craziness. I know people that have made a big deal out of dreams they had that had nothing to do with God. Um, but if you have a dream that is in alignment with the word of God, and it's worth saying that every dream and every vision and every prophecy will align with the word of God. Nothing trumps the word of God. The written, known word of God. It's forever settled in heaven. You will be able to interpret dreams and interpret circumstances through the lens of the word of God. So it's important to get that into your mind, get that into your heart, become familiar with with that knowledge. My brother and I used to play a game when we were young. We would sit in the back of the car and you know some people when they're driving on the road they'll they'll play little memory games and uh, how, how does that old saying go Ridley Ridley re I double D I see something you don't see <laughs> or something like that. People play games, kids play games. Well our game was we would take the New Testament and we would sit down and we would open the Bible and we would read a verse to one another. He'd be across the seat. I'd be across the seat. Um, I think my sister just thought we were crazy. <laughs> um, and we would have to guess based on that verse where it was at. Book, chapter, and verse. <clears throat> so where it was at in Romans, where it was at in First and Second Corinthians, where it was at in Galatians. And if you got the book, you got one point. If you got the chapter, you got two points. If you got book, chapter, and verse, that was a three-pointer. <laughs> and we would while away the hours as dad was preaching and mom was there and our sister was there. And we would be back there doing that. And then later on, we traveled together. We would do that. It was a, a great joy to do it. And we didn't realize it, but we were sharpening our spiritual acumen growing in grace and knowledge and falling in love with the word of the Lord. So good times, good memories. I will tell you that once you get to a point where it's chapter after chapter after chapter, where you're reading one, two, three books a day, um, 10 chapters, sometimes 20 chapters, you're digging into it. God begins to speak to you. Um, and I've said this before, and it bears repeating. I recommend praying before you read the Bible. And, and I, I make that like unto plowing the field so that the loam is accessed and the seed, which is the word of God, can fall upon it and can penetrate. I find that when I don't pray and when I'm rushed, 
but it, the, the word doesn't penetrate like it would have. And so a spiritually prepared, breaking up the fallow ground mindset is much more receptive to the word of God than just coming in and reading it to fulfill an obligation. I am not here to fulfill an obligation or just read it um, because I made some kind of commitment. But I'm here to commune with God. I'm here to talk with him. I'm here to sit at his feet. I'm here to seek his face. And so the scripture will come alive when you, when you approach it that way. When you have done these things, something very interesting will begin to happen. Themes will emerge. Patterns will emerge. You'll find that, that within the actual text, greater themes begin to emerge. And here's something to remember. Everything in that Bible points to Jesus. The law is the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. It is the educator to bring us to Christ. We are kept under tutors and under guides when we are immature under the Old Testament. And the schoolmaster guides us through the Old Testament. But then when the fullness of time comes, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. When faith comes, we're no longer under that tutelage. And, he, and, and the law is the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So the scripture points to Christ. When Jesus is talking to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, they didn't recognize who he was. They didn't know him. They couldn't see him. And as they walked along, he said, what's going on? And they said, are you a stranger? Have you not heard of the things that are going on in Jerusalem? And they begin to talk to him about how Jesus had been crucified, not knowing they're speaking to Jesus. And... He then begins from the prophets and the Psalms to declare, Moses, to declare all the things in Scripture that pertained to Christ. And he called them fools and slow of heart to believe the prophets. And, and he eventually revealed himself to them. Their eyes were open. They recognized him. So there is a, there's a closedness that we can have a blindness to the scriptures and the Bible says then opened he their understanding so there is an opening of the understanding there's a an, aha oh my goodness that's why he said this this is why he said that oh my goodness look at this and you'll begin to cross-reference and you'll begin to pull things um, here and there and the Bible says of every scribe that's instructed in the law brings out of his treasure things old and new so to pull from the Old Testament to pull from the New Testament that's a common theme is to how to bridge the two testaments and see how there is a, a lesser light in the Old Testament and a greater light in the New Testament. And you put them together and it becomes revelation. And you realize that God has been preparing you for his eventual appearance on the earth, his ministry, his earthly ministry, and even his, his eventual return in eschatology and prophecy. So <clears throat> let me point, put it this way. And, and I teach my Bible studies this, and, and maybe this will help you. And this is just you know, what I have found to be true. I'm sure there's many analogies that uh, those of you that are watching could share. And, and I would love to hear them. I would love to hear how you guys do this. But this is how I have taught people. <clears throat> When you're young, oftentimes you'll be given blocks to play with. We had blocks growing up. And on those blocks would be letters or maybe numbers. R, S, T, A, the letters of the alphabet. And, and at one and two, we had no idea what those letters were. They were just funny little shapes. We were playing with the blocks. We were stacking them. We were throwing them. We were slobbering on them. <laughs> um, and what those blocks were is there was a higher intelligence. There was an adult. There was an educator. There was a, a schoolmaster who put those letters on that block knowing that you might not know what you're looking at now. But the day will come when you will realize that you are looking at the building blocks of revelation. You will string those letters together and they will form words. They will form sentences. 
And so I'm revealing things to you before you know I'm revealing them to you. You are handling things. You think you're handling the block, but you are actually handling knowledge and wisdom. And that's what the Old Testament did for us. We handle the stories. We turn them over. We, we stack them. We, we teach them, not knowing we are handling the building blocks of Revelation itself. We're handling Jesus Christ before he gets here. So let me give you an example of what I mean. Um, as I said previously, there are themes that will begin to emerge. One thing that begins to emerge is, and we actually had a biblical question about this. Somebody asked a question about thorns. They said, Brother Urshan, could you answer this on Biblos? And I, and I guess this is me doing it. Um, is there significance to Jesus and his crown of thorns? Did it mean that there would be a battle within our minds and Jesus putting that crown of thorns on his head meant that he would overcome things in his mind. He would overcome thorns. It's a good question. And, and you, you want to be careful about superimposing ideas onto the scripture. You need to stick with solid chapter and verse. But once you've done that and once you've gathered that data and the data points to a thing and themes emerge, you find some amazing things. And the thorn is one of them. Go back to the beginning and look at the first thorns that emerge. The first thorns that we see come up from sin. God did not curse Adam. He cursed the ground. That was the curse that Adam received, was the cursing of the ground. It would not yield its strength to Adam. And instead of vegetables and increase, it would bring forth thorns and briars unto him. And this becomes a type of sin, a, a, an example of sin, a kind of sin. Instead of strength, it yields the thorns. Rather, instead, yeah, instead of vegetables and fruits, it yields challenge and adversity. And you have to work much harder than initially they did in the beginning. You keep following that theme. And <clears throat> Cain, when he's cursed, he is, the ground will not yield its strength to Cain. He's forced to wander. He has no, no certain place, no lot, no inheritance. And you keep moving forward. Eventually, you're going to come to the Exodus. And when you come to the Exodus, um, well, I, I, I could even back up before I say that. Let me say this. When Abraham offers Isaac on the altar, you see the ram caught in the thicket. You see it caught in the bush and in that region of the world that is likely thorns. It's caught. And so it's, this is a powerful metaphor and shadow of Jesus Christ being caught in our world of sin. Our crisscrossed, jagged, cutting, piercing world of politics and intrigue and the biases of men and women and the ulterior motives and the thoughts and the intents of our hearts and the, the, the desperate wickedness of the human heart caught between Caiaphas and Annas and Herod and Pilate and even Caesar himself. The ram was caught in the thicket. And that's another way of saying that Jesus was caught in time. He was caught in the affairs of men. He was caught in the thorns, the thicket. Now go to the Exodus. Moses leads them out of Egypt and they go into the wilderness of sin. That word sin there does not mean transgression. It doesn't mean um, iniquity or, or like we would use sin today, but it comes from the, the, word, the Hebrew word senna, which is thorn. It is literally the wilderness of the thorns. And when you come to the Mount Sinai, it is sin Ai. It is the mountain of the thorns. So when we are delivered and we are baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost in a New Testament context, we're going to go through a wilderness. We're going to go through a time of testing. We're going to go through a time of proving where we are going to learn to rely on God as we head towards the land of promise that flows with milk and honey. And we're going to go through our wilderness of sin, the wilderness of the thorns, um, the, the burning bush that Moses uh, went to and saw the Lord before he was called to Egypt. Um, that was a thorn bush. It was a, it was a bush of that day in, in that region. <clears throat> and the odds are that it was. And here is this flame that is on this jumbled 
push, this, this crisscross uh, back and forth without rhyme, without reason, just intertwined chaos. You ever met people whose lives are just intertwined and hopelessly entangled? You ever feel hopelessly entangled in your own life and you can't make a move because you get caught no matter which way you go? If I do this, this person's mad. If I do that, this person's mad. I could talk about that for a little while, but if you've ever felt that way, welcome to the thorns. Welcome to this world. Welcome to the challenge of making it through the wilderness of sin. And onto that bush, God sits and he speaks to him out of that bush. And the bush is on fire, yet it is not consumed. And this is a precursor to Pentecost, that even though you are a jumbled mess, a jumbled chaotic desert dwelling wilderness mess the holy ghost will still come upon you and will still baptize you and you will burn and you will not be consumed and it's a precursor to the day of pentecost when god would pour out his holy ghost upon them and cloven tongues like as a fire sat upon each of them peter speaking in tongues and worshiping God and being filled with the Holy Ghost burns with holy ghost fire there's no bigger thorn bush than peter <laughs> one minute he's uh chopping off Malchus ear another minute he's he's cursing at the fire another minute he's saying thou art the Christ the son of the living God another minute uh, Jesus is saying get thee behind me Satan thou savorest the things that be of men not the things that be of God that is a thorn bush and on to that man God poured out his spirit and he burned and yet was not consumed so this thorn bush this these thorns are types of sin. They're type of our humanity. They are, they are a type of our fallenness. You know, read the story of Judah and Tamar. That's a thorn bush. Read the, the story of Jephthah as he sacrifices his daughter. That's a thorn bush. Look at Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar, the thorn bush of thorn bushes. We just make a mess out of everything we touch, and the lamb came right down in the middle of that thicket, and he becomes our sacrifice and he becomes our substitute. And you make it through the wilderness of sin. When you get to the top of Sinai, the mountain of the thorns, God will help you rise above the thorns. He will give you laws. He will give you his word. It will pull you up from the valley, up to the mountaintop, and you can hear the voice of God. And eventually, if you make it through all of that, you'll come to the land of promise that flows with milk and honey. You'll eradicate the thorns from your life, and God will give you blessing. So this theme of the thorns, this, this, this concept of the thorns, eventually you get to Calvary and you see them take a crown of thorns and, and lacerate the brow of Jesus as he's crucified. And the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords conquers the kingdom of the thorns. He conquers the wilderness. He conquers Sinai. He conquers the failures of Moses. He conquers the failures of you and I. He, he conquers death and hell he spoils principalities and powers he makes a show of them openly nailing them to his cross and they give him a crown of thorns and he conquers sin that it is on his brow is probably significant that he overcomes the ideas and the thoughts and the desperate wickedness of our heart and even the place of the skull Golgotha the place of the skull he chooses to die there I think there's significance that God would be crucified at the place of, of the skull. So this idea of the thorns is very powerful <clears throat> and it culminates in Jesus' crucifixion and he conquers sin in that way, the thorns. And you could follow that theme with anything. Follow the lamb in the scripture. If you follow the idea of the lamb, the lamb is Christ. So, so from Abel to Noah to Abraham, the ram in the thicket the Levitical priesthood and Solomon's sacrificing of the lamb uh, all the way to Calvary. And, and then this is the lamb of God who is sacrificed. And if you can see the lamb slain by Abel and the blood running down that altar and superimpose it over Calvary and that lamb of God and the blood running down the cross and the soldier saying, surely this man was the son of God. The idea of the lamb is a very powerful, powerful archetype. It's a, it's a theme that emerges. And, and the more you read about the lamb, 
you realize there's a greater theme of the lamb, the thorns, the serpent. The serpent is a, is a powerful theme, archetype, shadow type of Satan. He's a serpent in the garden. He's a dragon in Revelation, but it's that old serpent, the devil. And so all through the scripture, it is a serpent. Even as Jesus Christ is typified as a serpent, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, is because he became sin who knew no sin. Like Satan comes in the likeness of sinful flesh. So it typifies him as a serpent. On and on and on. The father, the idea of the father, um, you know, when, when um, Israel sends Joseph to his brethren, that's the father sending the son to the brethren. When Abraham offers Isaac on the altar, that is the father <clears throat> offering up his only begotten son. So the archetype of the father is extremely powerful. So these themes begin to emerge as you read. And every time you see father, begin to think God the father. Whenever you see the serpent, think, think Satan, think um, fallenness. Whenever you see, you know, another one is sword, the sword. The sword is the word of God. Every time you see the sword, begin to think word of God. It represents a greater truth as these themes begin to emerge. Now, before you get to that thematic subject matter level, you do have to get the data into your mind because if you don't have that baseline knowledge of, of chapter and verse, then you're going to misapply things and you're going to miss those archetypes and you're, you're going to misinterpret what you're reading. So it is a way to see bigger themes and the bigger purpose of God. And when you put it all together, a beautiful tapestry is woven of revelation and insight that will edify you, that will sustain your children, your heritage and your legacy in the kingdom of God. So that is how I read the Bible. One last thing I'll mention before I wrap up this session is when you read, and I've done this and I continue to do it, I keep a journal. Years ago, I, I wrote with pen and paper in a journal. I would, a thought would come to me. I would write that thought in a journal. Now I type it. I can type much faster than I can write. It's a lot neater. And so as I'm writing, or rather as I'm reading and I'm praying, I'm meditating, thoughts are coming to me. And that is God. God when, when the Lord speaks to my heart, it's not like this audible voice. It's like my, he begins to guide my thoughts. These images and thoughts begin to come to me and they're not coming from my mind. They're coming from outside of my mind. And I rush to write them down and I capture those thoughts. That's what I call writing them down, capturing the thought. And if, you've, if, you, if you don't take the time to write the thought down, you probably are going to lose it. Anybody that's ever... Um, experience this knows what I'm talking about. You'll, you'll get a great thought from God. You'll say, wow, I'm going to preach that or I'm going to teach that or, or I want to, I want to really remember that. And then when you go to retrieve it later, you've totally forgot it, forgotten it. And there's actually scripture for that. You know, the Bible says that the sower goes forth to sow seed and some falls by the wayside. And later on the fowls of the air came and devoured that seed from the wayside. I believe the devil comes and takes those thoughts from us that we cannot be edified. The fowls of the air devour the seed. So don't let them do that. Write it down. Capture the thought. Come back later. Meditate on it. One of these times when I have a little more opportunity to speak <clears throat> and I'm not so constricted time-wise, I need to talk to you about the ruminants and the cows and how they chew the cud and how that is an example of meditation. It's a powerful concept in the scripture, but it's another topic for another day. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm out of time. Um, there's a lot going on and I got to run to it. And I, I hope this is a blessing to you. I hope it's just a little shot in the arm that can be a blessing to you. Take the time to read the word of God. Fall in love with it. When you read it, look to Jesus. The schoolmaster will reveal his purpose and his plan to you. And you will find that, that God has a reward for those who read his word. So until next time, God bless you. God keep you. And God cause his face to shine upon you.